I learned a lesson the hard way. So in a car or in this tester, you would think this is a good coil, but the capacitor is no good. A properly operating coil is going to really make a difference at higher RPM so that you get that nice shower of sparks at the right moment. I thought we would try and compare each of the testing systems to see what that testing equipment can tell you about the coils and what it can't. When you're having trouble with your Model T and it's not running right, there's four things you need to remember. Ignition, 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 <laughs> and ignition. Today I'm here with Russ from Paris. And uh, Russ is a friend of mine who's got incredible knowledge about Model Ts. Um, you can see in the background his project car. Russ, welcome to Flivver Channel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is this your first Model T, Russ? No, it's my second Model T. I uh, started my first one when I was 17 years old and bought $200 worth of parts and eventually five years later ended up with a uh, depot hack. Okay. So, and this was my parts car from then. Okay. <laughs> and so yeah, 40 years later, here we are. So you're restoring it ground up. Yep. What is, what, what car is it? Can you tell us a little bit about it? It's a uh, 1923 touring car. Uh, obviously, it's a Canadian car, so okay. it's got a lot of differences between uh, between the American and Canadian production cars. Um, it uh, it's been a lot of challenges along the way trying to identify those, but uh, it was produced the uh, last week that Canadian production ran on the low hood. Okay. And uh, a week later, they were into the high hood 23 to 25 type cars. Mm -hmm. um, my dad's aunt and uncle bought it new. They were on vacation driving to see my grandparents when they burned out a connecting rod on their okay. 1915 T. They limped into the next town. Fortunately, they had a Ford dealer, and uh, so they came out of there with, uh, with this. <laughs> Um, like a lot of cars, it got used, it got used up. Uh, it was disassembled in the Second World War and they tried to make an airboat and power it with the Model T engine, but that didn't go well. So it got brought home, uh, tossed behind the house in the, in the tall grass and forgotten about until I found out about it in, uh, in the 1976. And uh, I was told I could have it, but I needed to wait till spring because it was <laughs> it was snowing up there. Snowing. And uh, by the time I got there, um, the body had been stolen. So I spent probably a good 30 years collecting all the pieces that I needed to uh, to rebuild it. And I think uh, the only thing I got left to find is a convertible top mechanism. Oh boy, good. So, so, so you found basically a not rolling chassis. Correct. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it it had been disassembled uh, uh, quite a bit. To the only thing that was left assembled was the engine was still on the frame from when they had tried to hook an airplane propeller to it and mm -hmm. turn it into an airboat, but uh, the the engine wouldn't run properly, so they mm -hmm. gave up on it and. Yeah, everything else was just pieces. All right. So you've been piecing it together from parts you can find, trying to find <coughs> Canadian matching parts from the right vintage and version. Yes, and uh, it's it's been quite a challenge because um, American cars are very well documented, whereas the nuances of the Canadian cars, it's, uh, it's not documented that well. <laughs> and... Uh, Sometimes it involves a little bit of head banging, you know, mm -hmm. there's a flat rock out the side there, you know, <laughs> where, I, where I go from time to time. But uh, yeah, there's a lot more to it than just the driver's door. That's mm -hmm. the one everybody recognizes, but uh, there's, there's quite a few differences. Well, we'll have to uh, have a 
separate video just to go over those details sometime. That'd be really interesting. But you're making good headway. It's almost ready for paint, it looks like. Well, we're still a long way off of the paint, okay. but uh, um, yeah, I was hanging doors yesterday, so uh, I still got two more doors to, uh, mm. to go. And uh, the motor is rebuilt. It's in a test stand. It's been run in a number of times. And so uh, when, uh, when this is ready, <laughs> Go. In that goes. Right on. Okay. But that's not what we're here today to talk about. Um, you invited me over to look at and uh, um, experiment with your different coil testing machinery. You've got a hand crank coil tester, I see. Is this uh, original from the day? It is. Um, near as I can tell, it probably was uh, manufactured sometime in the mid to late 20s. Okay. It's uh, manufactured by Allen. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, is original in appearance, as you can see. Um, it, uh, it did have to be rewired and the, mm -hmm. uh, and the magnets recharged, but uh, it's essentially, you know, as found. Good, good. And you've got the ECCT that we've worked with before in my other video about uh, coil testing and uh, a buzz box. And I've brought my homemade buzz, buzz box as well. And uh, I thought we would try and compare a couple of coils through each of the testing systems to see what that testing equipment can tell you about the coils and what it can't. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what the pros and cons of each of the system are, as well as we can determine. And uh, just see how each of them work in comparison to the other. Yeah, there's, uh, as with everything, there's pros and cons. You know, cost is usually a big one, or mm -hmm. what the tester can do for you or can't do for you. Right, cool. All right, so um, for the viewers who aren't familiar with Model T coils... While we're sitting here comfortably, we should talk about these a little bit. And uh, um, in the Model T, um, each cylinder, it's a four-cylinder engine, each cylinder has its own ignition coil. So it's, in a lot of ways, like a very modern engine that has a, a coil-on-plug system. In this case, it's a coil-per-plug system. And uh, each coil is one of these wooden boxes with... Um, um, ignition coil components inside, and a set of double points, which are also kind of unusual, on the, uh, um, on the top. And when the uh, timer, or what I guess other people would consider to be similar to a distributor, hits the right um, sector for each uh, cylinder to fire, these coils get energized by the electrical system of the car, either six volt DC, or the uh, high voltage AC signal that comes from the rotating magnet magnetos, right? And uh, when it gets energized, it starts to flutter across the points and generate a high voltage, something like 20,000 volts, um, um, shower of sparks output that goes to each spark plug. So when you hear these buzzing, that's the vibrating points giving you about 200 hertz, about 200 cycles per second of sparks. So at low RPM in the engine, the system is actually sparking repeatedly for each um, ignition cycle, yep. um, which is kind of cool. And uh, some of the modern engines are doing that again too, because it gives you better burn, better uh, economy, better performance, more reliable running. But as you get up in RPM, then the 200 hertz frequency of these really works itself out to be only about one or so sparks per, per ignition. So a, uh, a properly operating coil is going to really make a difference at higher RPM, I think. Now, I haven't experienced this yet myself because my car just doesn't like revving up. It's kind of old and tired. But from what I hear, if you have a really nice running engine that's well balanced and tuned then having really good tuning on your spark plug coils um, helps it run better because you're only getting that one spark per per ignition and you don't want to miss it or have it at the wrong timing 
Well, and when you're only working with, you know, say 20 horsepower and, and maybe, you know, the modified cars with, you know, higher compression mm -hmm. might, might get close to 30 horsepower. Mm -hmm. um, having a bit of faltering here or, you know, maybe not set just quite right mm -hmm. can make a big difference to how they run. Sure. Now, when we talk about coiled tuning, what are we talking about? Because it's, I mean, it's not a musical instrument. What, what is coil tuning? Well, coil tuning is um, A, setting the gap between the points. Mm -hmm. Yep, setting it in there. And then to some extent, there may be a need to adjust the pressure of that top plate. And so you can come in under the side here, right? And this is a little, a little tool. It's a hammer on one end and a little slot on the other. And you can come in here and you can either press down to decrease or up to increase the pressure of the little point that flutters on the underside. Right. There's a little, right. there's a little spring steel um, point um, beam that, that flutters. And yeah. you can change, so you can change the, the, um, pressure. the pressure on that spring which is like changing like like tuning an instrument you're changing yep. the tension in the toy in the uh, in the string and then the bottom cushion spring i believe they call it you can either increase it by striking mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. or you can decrease it by going in underneath and then bending up okay all right so and tuning is is adjusting the uh, pressure through bending or flexing the different spring elements yes. to get everything to uh, operate mechanically correctly so that you get that nice shower of sparks at the right moment and uh, without delay or with, uh, not being too soon. And the right output and out the of right it. right output of uh, voltage as well. Yeah, okay, like a, sh yeah. a, a bright energetic spark. Okay. Yeah. And I guess another big aspect of um, either rebuilding, maintaining, or um, um, repairing these coils is what's inside the box, right? Because yep. inside, I think we have a, a primary winding of um, a heavy gauge copper wire with low number of turns, and then some very fine wire secondary windings over that with many, many, many turns, and then a big condenser or um, capacitor, right? Yep. That's yep. all that's inside there. That's basically it, yep. yep. And it's got three contact points that connect to the, uh, the coil box so that you don't have to solder up wires or anything like that when you plug these in and out of the car, okay. Very cool. All right, well, we will get set up here now so that we can uh, um, test each of these coil testing systems and see uh, what they tell us about some of these coils. We've got a few different coils here, and we'll we'll see what we can learn. All right, so thanks, Russ. We'll get a we'll get a new setup. <laughs> sophisticated tests with these instruments, I guess it's important that we first talk about the fundamental tests that you can do on a, a coil box before you do the sophisticated tests. Now, I'll link this um, Ron Patterson sheet. I believe it was Ron, yeah. In, in the uh, description below the video, so you can download it if you want. But it tells you what tests you can do on a coil with a multimeter for um, the resistance of the different windings, um, the um, capacitance of the condenser, also called capacitor, and how to set your point gaps and that sort of thing. So um, before you do any of the sophisticated tests, it's best to make sure that your coils are sound from the perspective of these fundamental multimeter tests. That being said, we've got three coils here that we're going to test today. Russ, what, what can you tell me about each of these? Well... This first one, <clears throat> this was taken out of a running, um, a running car. Um, it, uh, the, the, the car was difficult to start and it didn't run 
well, but it ran. And investigating it, um, doing a test across these two points and checking the um, secondary winding, it ended up that the reading, instead of being three, 2.63 in, in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. it was at that time 12.6. Right. Since then, it is increasing. Okay. So this coil is in the process of burning up. So as you mentioned, the secondary winding are, are very, very fine wires. And the wires are breaking and the, the gap is opening up. Okay. And so therefore the resistance is increasing as it keeps opening up farther and farther. And this up until recently would buzz in a tester, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't throw a very good, um, good spark at the plug. Mm -hmm. And so it would just be a matter of a very short time in the car before this totally failed. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, why it's really, really important to do a pre-check on all of your, on all your coils. This was a recent flea market find. I, I liked it because it had the, the Ford script. Um, a check with the secondary winding and everything, it, it all checks out. But it still has its original capacitor. So it's a hundred and something year old capacitor and I can put it in any of these three testers and it will act like it's fine. But because the capacitor isn't good, it, and at 100 years it fails its capacitor test, so capacitor is a storage unit mm -hmm. and it's like filling up a bucket of water that has a hole in the bucket. By the time you get to dump the bucket of water, you're missing some. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happens when you have an old capacitor that's failing. Mm -hmm. When it comes time to fire that spark plug, you're not getting that, what is it, 23,000 volts or whatever that goes to the plug. Mm -hmm. You're going to get less. Mm -hmm. How much less will depend on how far gone it is. Mm -hmm. So it's important, again, to do a pre-test of any coil that you're going to put in any one of these testers. Even though I rebuilt this one, it's always a good idea to check everything again mm -hmm. because I can't guarantee that that capacitor that I put in there wasn't defective. Mm -hmm. Or that you might have accidentally damaged those ultrafine wires in the secondary winding. Yep. Absolutely. So this one is, is a rebuilt and we'll, uh, we can use it for demonstration purposes. We can also use this one for a demonstration. So this one has a failing secondary coil winding, which is the very fine wires. Is that repairable? It is. You can buy from the parts suppliers a secondary winding, but um, they're too much money as far as I'm concerned. You could buy three, four, five coils for the same amount of money that do work. Mm -hmm. then, and then you have to get that apart and get the new winding over the old secondary. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's quite a lot of work, quite a lot of money. And I don't know, uh, you know, uh, at the flea markets, you're anywhere from $5 to $20, uh, depending on whether, you know, how good it works, um, how nice the woodwork is. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I like, uh, if I can find it, is there are, uh, for those of us that are Canadian, um, there will be a little Ford script with a C on it on the on the sliding cover of the box right. and so I'll sometimes pay a premium to uh, to get those sure. and the old coil boxes um, many of them still have perfectly good um, windings right it's the one thing that fails on these from age it seems isn't as often the windings it's the capacitor yes and so if you um, 
if you need a replacement coil because of a winding problem, just buy some more old ones and you're bound to find a good one in there and you'll be able to use it for many years. But any of the old coils that haven't had a capacitor change, you can pretty much count on the capacitor being failing, if not failed already, right? Yep. And you can buy a, a cheap meter from, uh, you know, parts suppliers. And, uh, you know, if I'm in the market for coils, mm -hmm. I'll, take, uh, I'll take a meter with me to a flea market. And uh, if somebody's asking 15 or $20 for a coil, and I really would like that one, I won't pay that until I check and make sure mm -hmm. that secondary you get a good winding. reading off of that secondary winding. Yeah. That's the most important one. Yeah. All right. So once you've done your fundamental checks, you're going to move on to more sophisticated tests on these coils. I mean, you could just put them in your car, see if they buzz, and try and run it. But for many of us who are looking to understand better the quality of our coils, or want to ensure that our car is going to run well when we put these in, we might want to do some bench tests if we can. And, well, uh, we're setting them. Yeah. We're setting them for optimal performance, right? right? Right, because if we did everything just on this sheet, we're going to get a coil that probably buzzes, Yeah. but isn't necessarily timing correctly, isn't necessarily giving you a bright spark, um, isn't necessarily giving you all the voltage that you want to get out of it, that sort of thing, right? Yep. Um, so these testers, all to different degrees, test different aspects of those other performance parameters that you can't guarantee just by doing everything on the sheet. Yep, correct. Okay. Um, so the most simple tester is what people call a buzz box. Um, you, you used to be able to buy these simple buzz boxes, which um, I don't think they're available anymore. I haven't been able to find anyone that's still carrying them. I think now they would be an eBay find. Yeah. Okay. And so what, what does a buzz box like this test in a coil? It just simply tests, and I believe it is the amperage going across the points. And Ford recommended back in the day, 1.2 amps to 1.4, with the sweet spot being in the middle at 1.3. And if you set with a buzz box, that's your goal. You're aiming for 1.3, right, amps. And mm -hmm. so you can see it's zero, one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. If we're at two amps or greater, then it's likely to cause internal heat and uh, possibly quicker failure of the coil. Right, okay. And if it's lower than one amp? Then sometimes they don't like to even fire, mm -hmm. um, or it's just not going to give you a hot spark. Okay. And it will if nothing else, just verify that the buzz box will buzz. Because you can have coil boxes that just won't um, spark. They won't buzz. So at least it's a quick way to verify that before you put it in your car and find out that you have one cylinder that's not firing. Well, when I first started rebuilding these, um, I learned a lesson the hard way. I, I was rebuilding them, putting new everything, new points, new capacitors, verifying with meters. And they wouldn't buzz. They wouldn't work at all. And so I thought maybe I was doing something wrong. And then I thought maybe it was the capacitors I was buying. So I was buying capacitors from different suppliers doing it. And it still wouldn't work. And it wasn't until I put a used set of points on them, cleaned the points a little bit, put them on, and everything worked, that I come to discover that new points have a crust on the points and if you don't sand and scuff those points just a little bit, it won't work, <laughs> right? And there's brand new points. Sure. Now these buzz boxes, um, what source power do they use? 
They use six volts. Okay, so you could use your battery in your car, or a six volt flashlight battery, or um, uh, a power supply if you have one. Anything. A battery that charger that's six, six volts, volts would would do it. All right. I so that bought, simulates. Sorry, that simulates operating off the battery in your car. Correct. I bought a flashlight battery seven or eight years ago, and I'm I'm still using that. Okay. You know. Um, so the little square ones, yeah. right? That'll do the same trick. Okay. Yeah, so that simulates your coils operating off the battery setting in your car, presuming your Model T has both a battery and magneto. Now, I know because Model Ts have both electrical suppl supplies, the battery and magneto, and because there's so many people who are trying to keep old cars running, some people run only battery, some people run only magneto, and some people have both. Um, so this is simulating battery operation, but it doesn't simulate how the uh, coil will perform on your AC high voltage magneto, right? Correct. It's, it's a basic setting tool, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's essentially what it is. Yeah. Okay. Now I know in my case, I've... I've built uh, a little buzz box. It does the same thing. It's just got a simple ammeter, got an old spark plug in there, and uh, a switch and some terminals and wires. And this is just in a dollar store wooden box. Um, but it does exactly the same thing. It's just telling you the current. It's got a visual spark indicator. This one has one as well. and. Uh, it's going to tell you the same thing. It also runs off six volts. So these two do exactly the same function. It'll be interesting when we test a coil in both of them, whether we get the same reading. If they don't, then that's indicating something about the consistency or the quality of the uh, instrument and or of the wiring and such. So what do you feel that that cost you to build? Oh, you can get all the parts for this for less than 30 bucks. The last time these were being sold about two years ago, they were $140 US. Wow. Yeah, yeah, no, so definitely. Right? So, I'll, uh, if people are interested, um, you know, make some comments in the, uh, um, in, in the comment section below the video, and then I can provide uh, plans, plans for these. Um, it's very simple, and you can lay it out any number of different ways, but um, all that really is involved is the spark plug and the ammeter and a bit of wiring. So. Uh, um, you know, I can give a parts list and, and a bit of a wiring diagram and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, a very economical tester. Yeah. Now, I've got a, a little box I've made just to make it easier to slide the uh, coils in and out. You don't have to do that. You can just connect the, uh, the, the leads to the coil. This one has something similar where you drop the coil in here. Well, well and, and if a person had a spare coil box, mm -hmm. they that could set work. it up to buzz off of one of the terminals. Sure that you've rebuilt yep. and all set up with new points. And so we can see the points vibrating. We're running 1.25 amps. And you can see the spark plug sparking away there. with the failing capacitor. Let's see if it's going. It was also the one that was tight. pretty tight in the box. We're running 0.8, so we're under current. This kind of makes sense from what you're saying about the operational capacitors. But that's also a, an old set of points, and uh, yeah, it really hasn't been uh, it, it hasn't been schmoozed. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll test the same two in the same order. Let's take this out of the equation. So that was a good one. At least you have to hold in. Right? Yep. So we're reading 1.4, 1.5, which reads higher than on this one, but in the same neck of the woods. And this 
is the failing capacitor. That reads just over one. So these two read a little different. Um, neither has a incredibly um, precise ammeter, and who knows wiring and that sort of thing, solder joints and whatever. Well, and the differences I don't think are enough to really make any difference. If you had 1.3 on this one and 1.4 on that, it, it's at the end of the day, it's not a game changer. All right. All right, and uh, as we mentioned, the buzz boxes don't test the timing as to when you get your first spark after you've given it a signal, and they don't test how well they'll work on the AC high voltage supply that the magneto provides. The other thing that is a, a major drawback with these is they can't detect um, when you have a double spark. So a double spark is when um, the upper point set, where the point that vibrates in the, uh, in the upper set is very light um, springiness to it. And it has a tendency to flutter, I guess, more. And it creates multiple sparks at the same time. So instead of sending one good hot lightning bolt off to the plug, it sends a eh, kind of ish hot and then a weak mm -hmm. instead of sending that one good strong. And these other testers will test for that and it's something that you won't know with this tester and it you know if you're lucky maybe you set all four in your car you get lucky and and none of them will double spark but if it does then you're going to have one cylinder that's not running as well as the others right so if you've if all you've got is a multimeter and these are the only tests you can do and you put the coils in your car and they buzz you'll probably be able to get your car to run but it might not run as well as you'd like. And they may not last that long because you don't know what current they're, they're burning through, anything like that. If you also have made yourself an inexpensive buzz box and you test with it, then you know that you're running at a good current setting. And that's the only um, specification that Henry Ford had in the old days was the current setting. And, uh, and you know that they buzz. So again, it'll probably run, but still maybe not as well as it could because you're not checking for um, timing and you're not checking for double sparks. Yeah. Um, also, you're not checking for how it will run on Magneto. True. Okay. All right, so then I think next we'll look at the hand crank coil tester and uh, talk about it. So if you're lucky enough to have one of these hand crank coil testers from either from the old days or from a more recent build-it-yourself kit, you've got some more testing options for coils. Yeah, and this closest replicates what is happening in your car. When you're running on Magneto. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. Because as you know, Magneto is set to run basically at 6 volts, but in reality at idle, it may not be making six volts, depending on how healthy your, your magneto mm. is. Or if you have a very healthy magneto, it can be up 12, 14 volts, maybe more, mm. right? So it, it gets that range. Right. Now you're cranking this at, I guess you're trying to simulate engine RPM, but you'd have to crank pretty hard to get to engine idle. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's impossible to uh, you know to even get four or five hundred RPM mm -hmm. cranking it manually, but um, even at two or three volts, you'll 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 see the uh, the thing fire, mm -hmm. and you'll see all of the little blue sparks that come around the ring. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to shoot a blue spark off of the end of the tip to the ring, and this is just an old brake off of uh, 
off of an earlier car. Hmm. And so you're cranking it up and you're watching it to see it spark. And of course, if it double sparks, you'll see two. You'll see two sparks coming off of it. And uh, you, can, you can actually visualize double sparks with it if in a dark room, I suppose. Yep. Interesting. All right. And what, what do you get from the instruments? So this is your amperage. Oh, so that's the same as here. Is exactly the same. And again, with this, they've even um, got the little sweet spot in there. So right. this is at one amp, one and a half. So our sweet spot is again somewhere you know around that one point one point three, give mm -hmm. or take a little. Yeah. And then, um, just recently, just a few weeks ago, the DC volt. Um, gauge quit on it oh, that's for right. the first so time that in would, 100 years so it that would normally it in. that would normally show you your your voltage that that's created as you're cranking yep. it yes okay interesting all right and you can look at the sparks from the needle here or you can drop a spark plug in it right yep it also has a couple of little Pulls along the side here and you can physically hook a magneto up to it and the magneto and then you start the car and mm -hmm. then you can see exactly how many volts your magneto is producing as you rev the engine okay. up and down right nice okay all right so we can we can test the same two coils so we started always with the rebuilt one yep All right, and so you just wind it up, and again, this one. <laughs> We're gonna, there it goes. There we go. All right, and so this coil was set. I'm not winding it fast enough. <laughs> this coil was set on the EECT, yeah. rather than setting it by mm -hmm. amperage. So it's a little high. It's running, mm. I guess, what, around 1.5 that I yep. see? Yeah. Okay. But you can see it firing all the way around. Right, right. Now we can do the same thing. This is the one with the failing capacitor. Yep. It's tight in there, too. Right. So this one has a lower low current, yeah, current. which we saw over here as well. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Cool. So I'm only really generating probably about two volts, three volts mm -hmm. by hand cranking it at that speed. Right. But it's enough mm -hmm. to be able to set your coil. So in a car or in this tester, you would think this is a good coil. Yeah. But the capacitor is no good. Yeah, although it was, it, even on this one, it was running low on the current. Yep. And what this tester can do, as well as some of the other ones, is I can set a spark plug on here and then wind it up. And it'll physically fire the spark plug. Yeah, that looks like quite a weak spark, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and you it can see how low is. the current is there. Yeah. yeah. So there's some clues even on this machine that that something's not right. Yeah. Yeah. And this unit has the ability as well to physically hook. So you can put a spark plug. You in can there put too. a spark plug. This is this is out of a lawnmower, so it's yeah. too short. But you yeah. would you would put your spark plug in there right, that right. way, okay. and you can test it again. Yeah. Mine the same, has it in there. Yeah. Okay. The same cool. again as that. The drawback to these, they don't set by time. They set by amperage output, which is what Henry originally mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. But the main drawback is, is these are rare as hen's teeth. And when you do find them, they may or may not work. And uh, when I got this, it didn't. It required rewiring. It required charging the magnets. The, we had an mm -hmm. awful time trying to charge the magnets. That's why there's all these spots around the ring. We just kept trying and trying. Truck batteries wasn't doing the trick. Finally, a welder. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we had to hook a welder up to it before we could get the, uh, the magnets to take charge. Because yeah. um, these use an actual 
Model T flywheel with magnets and an actual Model T coil, just like you'd have in the car. And brake ring. And a brake, brake ring. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so it really is, other than, you know, it's, it's, it, if you can spin the crank fast enough, it's very accurately simulating the, uh, the car. Yep. The, the operation of the coil in the car. Is there any gearing or is it one-to-one -one when you It's one-to-one. -one. Yeah, if it had gearing, it'd be a lot easier to get the RPMs up to an idle speed or something like yep. that. Yeah. And the, you know, the other thing is, is if you could somehow hook a, an electric motor oh, to yeah. it, or or put a, a little pulley on it or something on the front. Yeah, even a, a cordless drill. Yeah, actually, that would be good. Yeah, you, you'd get a higher voltage mm -hmm. output because you just cannot wind <laughs> that thing fast enough. Right on, right on. Okay, cool. Now, the most sophisticated testing apparatus we have available to us here today is your ECCT, electronic, electronically crank coil tester. Electrically crank coil tester? Yes. Sorry if I've got, there it is. Electronically crank coil tester. And it does some of the same things that our other testers do, do but it does other things. And then there's some things it doesn't do, right? Correct. Yep. Now, this is the standalone unit. I understand it's available with um, plug into a computer as well to get even more functionality. True. So this is um, the basic unit. You get the power pack and the unit itself. Right now that retails for $440 US. It's sold by a man by the name of Mike Kosar. Um, I bought this from him at Hershey a few years ago. It also has the ability not only to data log into a computer, so you can, you can buy from Mike a patch cord to take it to your computer, but it also has the ability to test a magneto. But again, that is an option that you, you buy on top of okay. the cost of the unit. All right. So it is probably the most sophisticated, but it is the most, well, yeah. okay. <laughs> it is expensive. It's, it's expensive, yep. right? Yep. And um, it has capabilities beyond those which we can describe today if you were to connect it into the computer as well. Okay. Correct. So this has the ability to test a capacitor. We can do a single fire of the spark plug or of the uh, of the coil. Mm -hmm. We can do a multi spark test mm -hmm. of the coil. And it also, like I said, it has the ability to test the magneto. Okay. Over on this side, it tells you whether we have an excellent reading, a good reading, or a poor reading. And then this is the scale that we are aiming for the middle of that scale at zero. Mm -hmm. And ideally, every time that spark fires, we're trying to get it to fire at exactly the same spot or as close to that spot as possible. It may be a little over, a little, a little mm -hmm. early, a little late. And so this side here um, is when we're firing um, a little too late. This is firing a little too early, All right? And the idea is with this unit that when you have four coils, if you have a coil that's firing early and the next cylinder is firing late as the piston comes up we want consistency across all four pistons to mm -hmm. optimize the power put out by the engine mm -hmm. so that it's not fighting itself through inconsistent timing yeah so this is the first tester that checks the timing of the coils relative to the signal that the um, timer or the distributor on the car um, provides. All the other testers we've looked at ignore timing and just verify that it's buzzing, verify that it's buzzing with the right amount of uh, current, um, but ignore timing altogether. This unit can test the capacitor for you, so you don't need to use any sort of other capacitance tester and then it checks the timing, but it doesn't check the current, 
it's operating on 6 volts again, so it's not checking performance under magneto conditions, it's checking performance under battery conditions. And uh, is there anything else? What about double sparks? Does this one help it you with that? It shows double sparks, okay, yes. Good. All right. So really the only thing that we've been checking that this doesn't check for you is the current. Correct. So <clears throat> I found that you can have the, it in the sweet spot on this and it maybe only puts out one amp or less sometimes by the buzz box mm -hmm. or what oftentimes happens is is it might be in excess of two mm -hmm. on the buzz box and and they say don't worry about that don't worry about it well the byproduct of uh, current is heat mm -hmm. and heat in these is known to cause um, failure of the secondary winding right so when I um, have one that um, I, I check it I'm happy with it I automatically put it back in my buzz box and I'll see where it is and if it's reading high or low I go in and adjust the pressure on the mm. upper plate and then put it back, set it, it again it here, again. verify yeah. it again, and try and get it mm -hmm. to where it fires optimal, but mm -hmm. doesn't uh, put out so much current sure. that I'm afraid it's going to burn up in the car yeah. in, in limited time. Yeah, so if you only have a buzz box, you can't tune your coil to timing specifications and you can't check double spark. If you only have an ECCT you can tune your coil to timing, you can eliminate double spark, you can check your capacitor but you can't tell what current it's drawing so you don't know how it's going to do long term with heat and that sort of thing. Yeah, okay. So every time I set coils for someone I'll set it with the ECCT, verify it with a buzz box and then when I'm happy with those, Both. I'll throw it in here and just run it under magneto settings. Magneto. Yeah. And if it's good for all of them, you know you've got a really good coil. Exactly. Yeah. So when we want to test the capacitor, you have to put a piece of paper or in this case it's just a little piece of cardboard or you've got to hold it down, hold the uh, Keep bottom the points plate open, down. Yeah. To turn it on, we just simply press this until the light comes on, right? And then we're on capacitor, so we'll press the button, right? I've got one light and excellent. So that means my capacitor is in excellent condition. And this is a new capacitor. Mm -hmm. I take that piece of paper back out and I'll go down one spot here mm -hmm. and I'm going to single fire this coil. Yeah, and it's drifting right. around from zero to plus one to plus two, which, I mean, it's a mechanical system, so it's going to have variability, but it's generally hitting zero more often than not. So what it's saying every time Come on. And now it's hitting there, <laughs> no, there's one. plus okay. one. So every time we're in this area, yeah. it's saying pry up. Yep. If I'm over here, then I have to tap it, tap it down. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to set, mm -hmm. right? Now we'll do the same test, but under, and I believe it's 100 um, sparks. sparks. And it'll statistically collect the data from those 100 sparks and give you yes. an overall result of good, and you're just drifting between 0 and 1. So it'll either be poor, good, or excellent. Yeah. Um, good is 85% or better. Excellent will be 92% mm -hmm. or better. Um, I'm told that... Um, 
if I data logged this, tied it to a computer, then I could see exactly each one of mm -hmm. those points to better understand, sure. you know, where to play with it. So ideally, what I would want to do maybe is, is if I tried to, to hit the excellent, I would have to pry up, Tiny but bit, so just yeah. the smallest amount, yeah. right? And so for all intensive purposes, this is a good coil. Yeah. Right, set by timing. Yet, in the buzz box, it was reading high. Yep. Not high to the point where I was concerned that it would burn up, though. Mm -hmm. yep. right? So that's why, for me, when I set uh, any coils, I'm always kind of playing and trying to make sure that I'm happy with it in all the three testers. Sure. Um, again, <clears throat> you know, we're being told, don't worry about the amperage readings off of it. Just set it by timing and what will be will be. Well, and I think if the timing is good, it's going to probably run well. But is it going to last as long as it could? Is it going to heat up? Um, you know, what are the other effects of too high or too low current over time? Maybe you're... Um, points a road or something like that I don't know so it's a, a question that's, um, that I don't know the answer to but uh, certainly by using all the testers that you have available to you you can get perfect coils because you can uh, make sure that it's um, testing correct to all the different specifications so here's that original Ford script coil mm -hmm. never been opened has a hundred year old capacitor, which has failed mm -hmm. the capacitor test, yeah. or I guess, you know what, we should try the uh, capacitor test Might for this well. one. Yep. All right, so we put our little piece of paper in it. We're gonna go back to the capacitor test. All right. We put it in, hit the button. Poor. Poor. Yeah. So it's detected that the capacitor isn't up to the job yet when I put it on a multi spark it works and it will let you set it so this is why it it's comes back exactly to exactly yeah, the same it's, yeah. it's, it's saying it's a good yeah. coil yeah well you would think so until you put it in your car they might not run well because the spark might be weak or as the capacitor degrades it could weaken um, but luckily this unit tests both capacitor and the timing so you get all that except the current yeah yeah so this is where it comes back to what you were saying earlier that you need to verify that you have a good coil before you use any one of these testers mm -hmm. Because you can have, you know, one that looks good, feels good, you know, everything Could works pass on whatever it. Whatever test you you happen to have as a tester, but it's got some other problem. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Interesting. Very cool. And then to shut it off, you just push and hold the button. Very nice. And, and it's off. so compact, you could take it with you. Um, on a tour or something like that. So if your car starts misbehaving and you think that it might be fuel or something else, you'll know to check your four um, key um, diagnostic indicators, ignition, 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 and ignition. Yep. And <clears throat> I think for original cars that don't get run hard, um, you know, that the average hobbyist just wants to, uh, you know, go for a leisurely cruise or, or be in a, in a show somewhere in that, mm -hmm. you know, setting it with, with your uh, a buzz box is, is probably going to give you uh, an adequate running, uh, adequate running car. Um, if you have a newer engine, higher compression, you're running higher speeds, then it becomes more critical to Mm -hmm. to go this way. Yeah, I can see that the, the timing would become more and more critical for um, a higher RPM.
Russ, that was really interesting. Thank you very much for showing me these different uh, coil test systems. And You're it was welcome. great to talk about them and understand the differences between them. Well, and, and hopefully um, it may help other people that are out there that are, you know, struggling with a, with mm -hmm. a car that's not running well. Yep. And, uh, you know, we have a, a common friend who uh, uh, has a, a lot of Model T experience and, and he has a saying that when you're having trouble with your Model T and it's not running right, there's four things you need to remember. Ignition, ignition, Ignition <laughs> and ignition. So hopefully today, going through some of this, you know, um, we we can maybe uh, help other people that are that are struggling with a car. Right on. Well, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome.